Okay, just to, you know, just to seek the Lord. Like the Bible said, if you seek him, you'll find him if you search for him with all your heart. We didn't just gather here just to, to talk and to have some good ideas. We gathered here to meet with each other and with the Lord. And so I just, I just love it that you all are here. I love it that you guys are committed to God and to his kingdom. And for those of you that are gathered online too, thank you for being here. We just love you. Let's open in prayer. Lord, we just come this morning. We thank you so much for who you are, for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, for, Lord, for even just the beautiful weather. Lord, we had a really nice taste of summer back early in the week. And then we got that nasty cold on Friday. And now it's nice again. I like the warm better, Lord, so just keep it coming. Lord, I just pray, Lord, as we worship you today, this will be a great day just of enjoying your presence, Lord. Speak to each of our hearts. Lord, touch each of our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
leaving the rest behind My heart is satisfied Because of you Only you
seems like we're alone we're never alone it's only you lord we just thank you today lord for your faithfulness for your goodness for your kindness to us lord for lord always calling out to us and calling us into a, a life with you lord the best life we can live lord i just thank you today we welcome you holy spirit your presence in this place today lord we ask you lord as we've been talking about for several weeks lord just that you would fill us fresh and new again today Lord, that we would experience, Lord, the Lord, tangible presence of your God here in this place, in this setting. Lord, in, in the cars, standing up here, Lord, and all around, Lord, in, in living rooms around the peninsula. God, I just pray that your power and your presence be with us. Lord, say, I, I just, I want to remember again, Lord, Nancy's family, Lord, that you'll just be with them and strengthen them during this time. Lord, I pray for Lord, uh, Joyce Cosby's family too, Lord, as they've lost their mom and their their wife, and Lord, all that. Lord, I just pray you just be with them and touch them and bless them. Lord, we pray for Ziggy today, Lord, that Lord, as he's battling through this this uh, this thing, God, that you would, Lord, just even reveal yourself to him fresh today, Lord, that you would just, Lord, touch his body, Lord, and that you would make a way. In Jesus' name, we thank you, because you are good, you're awesome. Amen. Amen. And we'll welcome everybody again. I'm. Ah, oh, it's just so it's so nice. I wish you were all sitting around here right now. Is it okay if I stand down here instead of up there? I really, I don't like being up. I like being see you guys. I can actually see through the windshield when I'm standing here. Anyway, I just, uh, I just, I just, you know, I'm so thankful that we could gather together. And I just want to encourage anybody that's been following us online through the whole pandemic. You know, maybe some of you have never even been to Jubilee, never even thought about coming before. But I just want to encourage you, you know, like on the 20th, on Father's Day weekend, we're opening up outside here. We can see the thousands, probably, easy. And um, we want you to come. We want to meet you. We want to look you in the eye and say hi. We want to let you, we just want you, we want to know you. Like, I, I, I love church together, like I'm honestly. So we're going to be starting to have our kids ministry starting again. At, on that date and, and nursery and stuff. So if you haven't been able to come because of kids, like, you know, just come. We want to see you. I, I just think that there's nothing better every every week than gathering together in the name of Jesus. There's so much power in that, so much comfort and so much hope in that. So I just want to encourage all of you. And thanks for all of you that have come out today. Anyway, we're, we're going to start a new series, but I guess I should make a you know announcement again because some of you weren't here yet because I was announcing it when we're online father's day here we're going to treat the fathers awesome we get a nice little gift coming we're hoping it gets here on time because you know the way it is with uh covid and shipping well we're, we're open if it doesn't we'll get it to you right shortly after but it's also our day where we do our his house offering where you can give joyfully to the lord it's just an extra gift to him and again just do what's in your heart to do if god tells you to give nothing then don't give anything if he tells you to give you know a dollar give a dollar whatever whatever god speaks to your heart just do that because we just god has always met all our needs here and he's going to keep continue to meet them but anyway we're starting a new series today i'm i'm happy about this series because i think it'll be helpful to a lot of people i i think that a lot of people are struggling um in life with so many different things 
and they need to be free. You know, so some people are like, well, you know, I'm free, I'm good, you know, because I don't, I'm not addicted to drugs, I'm not really addicted to much, I'm like, I like, you know, whatever, but I'm not, I'm good, right? But the truth is, most of us have things in our life that have held us captive. And this series is called The Mindset Free. I'm taking it from a book by Jimmy Evans. I, I really love Jimmy Evans, probably one of my, I've never met him, I've seen him, I've been in a room with him, but I never actually met him. But he's probably one of my greatest mentors in life, actually. So this is a, this is a series that I think you'll find really practical. Hopefully it'll help you to understand how your mind works and how God wants to work in your mind. And, um, and it'll set you free, set you free from a lot of things. So anyway, series is called A Mindset Free. It's my hope that through this series, you will get free. Does anybody need that? Does anybody just need to be free from stuff? Yeah, one or two, good. You know, honestly, we all need, we all need to be everything that God's called us to be. So many people live in bondage and some are obvious and some aren't. Some are in full view and some are well hidden behind the mask we wear in public. But either way, I want you to know and even more, Jesus wants you to know that you should and could be free. You can be free. It's not a it's not elusive. It's not it's not something that's that's only for certain people or for special people. You can be free. You can be free. So just even before we start today, why don't you just take a minute in your car and just say, Lord, I just need to be free of this. And you know what you know what it is. And I'm just going to pass some ideas by you about what some of these things can be. Um, some people are getting ready to shut me down already because you're like, no, 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 I'm good. Just like, whatever. Talk to people. Like, have a class for people that are stuck. I'm not stuck, but... I want to say this, if there's anything in your life that's holding you back from the life that God has planned for you, this message is for you. And I've been at this for a long time, and there's a few things that I'm working on getting free from. i got to be honest with you. Um, I, went off, um, I went off on Facebook this week because one of the greatest bondages that so many of us live in during 2021 is fear. We live in fear. Um, fear of death. I, I'm actually shocked. I'm actually shocked how many believers are afraid of death. I'm actually shocked how many believers are afraid of the thought that Jesus could return. Like, I'm just, I'm shocked by that because, like, this life we live is pretty good. Like, I mean, we live in Canada, it's still a pretty great nation. We have pretty great stuff. I'm looking around the parking lot here. Some pretty nice cars parked here. And, and I know a lot of you, you know, most of you aren't doing without much, right? But we're feared. We're afraid of death. Like, really? Why would we be afraid of death? And why would we be afraid of our, our life that's to come? Like, that's awesome. Fear of being ostracized, right? Because we don't agree with everything that everybody says. Like, you know, I, I read this meme that said, like, if you... Just because I don't agree with you, it doesn't mean that we can't be friends, right? But like in our culture today, if you don't agree with someone, you're the enemy. And we're afraid of being the enemy. I don't know about you, I like being liked. And I know a lot of you like being liked. And you don't like confrontation. And like 2021 is full of confrontation. Like just write a comment on something on the internet about COVID or about rules, and you'll find out how much confrontation there is out there on both sides, right? And we're afraid of it. I, I, I meet people all the time that are afraid of it. We're fear, afraid, for, afraid of the government. Like, I, I've, I've actually, I, I'm shocked in our country of Canada. I was walking in Chippewa Creek Conservation Area, and there's a guy that lives close to us, and, and he got out of his car when we were there, when, you know, just after some of the announcements about the police were going to pull people over and arrest people if they didn't obey the rules. And he got out of his car and he looked at me seriously. He said, are we even allowed to do this? I was like, buddy, don't worry about it. Just walk. Like, it's fine. Just walk, right? Enjoy your day. You're going to be okay. But, like, people are afraid of the government. They're afraid of the police. They're afraid of, 
of fines, right? They're afraid of all of it. Like people are living in fear. And God wants to set you free. People are afraid of getting the virus. And if you're not afraid of getting the virus, people are afraid of passing the virus to someone else. And then if you're not afraid of that, you're afraid that if you don't get the vaccine, you're going to die. And other people are afraid if they do get the vaccine, they're going to die. And, and there's all these things that are surrounding this year, right, that, that keep people in fear. People are afraid of what will come when this is over as far as employment and opportunity. But fear is not the only thing we're in bondage to. Pornography is a huge deal. Lust is a huge deal. Even in the church. Even in the church, it's a deal. I, I, I mentor a lot of guys that are, are dealing with that issue and are, are, need help and strength to get through it. And, and that's a big deal. Um, so not just lust for sex, but also lust for things, right? People, people have the inability to delay gratification. And, and that's one of the things that the Bible is really clear that we can live free from that. Like that we don't have to have everything right now because if we don't get it, we're going to miss out. So there's another fear, missing out. Some people are just afraid of missing anything. So they're, they live in fear and everything that they do is, is motivated by fear. Worry is another one, right? A lot of people worry about silly things, right? But worry. Um, unforgiveness. Ooh. I'm serious, people. This is a huge deal. Unforgiveness will ruin your life. It'll make you bitter. It'll make you angry. It'll suck the joy out of your life. And you need to be free. And it's not that hard to be free. You just got to trust God and forgive. And when I say forgive, I don't mean that you just forget everything that person did. Like, I, I'm, I know this family, and this lady's a lovely lady, and she loves people, and she lives with a really short list for everybody. Except her daughter was married to a man who abused the kids, and he, she cannot forgive him. And I'm like, well, you have to forgive him. You have to let it go. you got to trust that God will do it. But all these things we struggle with, right? All these things we struggle with. The desire to be heard in unhealthy ways. So many people act up and act out because they need to be heard, they need to be seen. Like I find this on, on social media especially. So many people are such quiet people and kind in real life and then they get on social media and they're idiots like they're angry and they're bitter and they're like they have a big mouth and and then if you see them in public two days later they're like oh how's it going isn't it wonderful right like it's 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 so this is this is a bondage that people live in right guilt shame deception and so many other things but this series is about being set free no matter what the bondage, whatever you're struggling with. And I, there's a lot more than this. There's a lot more. And I'm, as I'm ringing these off, I'm sure there's people are starting to go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I need, to, I need to deal with that. And hopefully this will help you. To understand freedom, though, we have to realize that the battlefield for freedom is in our minds. The battlefield for our freedom happens right here. And we need to we need to have our minds set free. The series is about being free no matter what the bondage. God chose, think about this. You know the hill that Jesus was crucified on? Do you know what they called it? The skull. God chose to have his son crucified on a hill that was shaped like a human head. And don't miss the point of this, because like one of the greatest things that Jesus did when he died on the cross was he fixed our minds. He helped, he made a way for our minds to be free as blood and water flowed after they poked him with the spear and blood and water flowed 
It flew down, it, it flowed down over the mind, the head, the skull. It's a really, really graphic depiction, right, of what God wanted to do in our life. Jesus died to save us and set us free. And our minds are the central issue in the battle for our salvation and freedom. Until the transforming power of the blood of Jesus and the water of his word flow on our minds, we're in bondage. So the transforming power of the blood, right? We, we received Jesus. His blood was perfect. It was pure. It paid the price for our sin. The water always represents the word of God. And the word is what we need to wash our minds so we can be free. Like honestly, people, I don't know if you if you think about this, but the word of God, this Bible we carry, and I know like people carry it on their phones, they carry it all kinds of different ways. I, I think it's good to use your phone, I use mine, but I think it's good to have a hard copy of the Bible so you can take, take notes in it, so you can underline things, so you can find things back easier at times. Like, but the Word of God is like, it's got everything we need in it for life. Like, this Word of God was written 2,000 years and beyond ago. And it still confronts every issue in the human experience. It's still there to, to lead us and guide us, and it's still relevant today. Like, I'm, I'm looking at what's unfolding in the earth right now. And it's already all written here in the Bible. Really clearly, actually, if you, if you read it and study it. Like, it's so clear right now. The Bible's true, and it's for you. And it's not only just a book for information, but it's a book for transformation. It's a book to set you free. So, Francis, Francis Frangipane said this, a bondage is a house of thoughts. So many times we think our battle is not we think our battle is something that really isn't. We think like that this is the issue because this is the symptom. But a lot of times the, the issue is way deeper. Like, you know, myself, for a long time, I've struggled with like just being a little bit insecure, right? Like that, that God called me to do this, what I'm doing now. But uh, probably made a mistake. Just got to be honest, right? And because I didn't feel like I had the skills that a lot of pastors have, that I didn't have a lot of the 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 uh, uh, education that a lot of pastors have. I just felt like maybe God made a mistake, right? So whenever I started to feel a little bit more bold as a pastor, really start stepping out as a pastor, I start feeling really insecure. So then I try and find ways to make myself feel better about myself, right? So I, I'd find my favorite guy and I'd start to imitate them a little bit because they're pretty cool. I could be pretty cool too. Right, but until I came to the central issue, right, that the devil's a liar, and he's always trying to lie to you, and that God called me, and if God called me, he knew who I was, he knew the gifts that I had, he knew the abilities I had, he knew the people that were going to come around me as I, as I pastor, and I realized that God had given me everything I needed to do what he called me to do, all I had to do was just be who God called me to be, and not not feel insecure about it. Until I did that, I was always living in the bondage of, of not feeling like I could be enough. And then one day I just came to this realization, well, God chose me. I was actually sitting and doing marriage counseling. And it was actually with Josh and Leah. And, and I was sitting there getting ready for marriage counseling. And I was like, I was like reading all my books that I like to read and trying to draw quotes and this and that. And I really felt the Lord say to me, why don't you just tell them what you know? Like, you've been married 26 years or 25 years already. You've raised a good family. You're, you, you, you have wisdom. Why don't you use the wisdom I've given you? And I was like, wow, cool. And God really spoke to the inner part of me, and I really, it really changed the way I thought about things. Does that help you? I hope it helps. Because, like, there's so many times we're stuck because we don't feel like we have what it takes to do what we're called to do. We get stuck in the past, we get stuck in shame, we get stuck in blame, we get stuck in all kinds of things, but God really wants to set you free. He wants to set you free from anything. If you're, if you're addicted to alcohol today, if you're addicted to drugs, if you're struggling with mental illness, if you're, 
struggling in your marriage, if you're struggling with identity issues, whatever it is today, God wants to set you free. He wants you to be free. But you have to find the truth in God's word. And we're going to just build on this over the next, you know, a little while. Anyway, bondage is a house of thoughts. So many times we, we think our battle is something it's not, and so we try to fight it with willpower. Anybody try and do that? Like, I've been a fat guy most of my life, right? And, and like, so I was always trying to lose weight, trying to lose weight. And so I, you know what? They make you eat salad on a diet. It's like, there's nothing more disgusting to me than eating raw vegetables. Like, it's just awful, right? And so, like, I'm always saying, well... You know, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to lose this, I got to lose that. And then one day I just came to a thing that I was kind of struggling with some, some disease issues and I, I just wanted to learn to get healthy. I wasn't thinking about my weight, wasn't thinking about any of that. And then I just decided I'm going to like do this instead. Well, before I was trying to fight everything in my willpower, you know, being strong. You know what the thing is about willpower? Willpower is like a rubber band. The harder you pull against it, the stronger it gets. And then after a while, it just flings you right back to where you started and beyond. Anybody ever experienced that? And so like, that's what happens a lot of times when we're dealing with stuff. We just get so, we're, we're oh, I can do it, I can do it, and we can't. And as soon as we get to the root cause of the issue, as soon as we change the way we think about something, we can change and we can do better, right? And we can be free. That's the big thing, being free. We fight the symptoms instead of the root cause of the temptation or the fear. And if you have a problem but are unaware of the true source, then you either you find false answers, right? Or you just believe there's no hope at all. How many of you have tried to change something in your life and just threw your hands up in the air and said, forget it, I can't do it. There's no way. It's impossible. Like it's, and so, but God says there's a way. There's a way to be free. There's a way to move forward. There's a way to have more of the life that God's planned for you. I gotta be honest with you, it's up to you. God can't do it for you. God will do it with you, but he can't do it for you. you have, your, your mind and your will have to be involved. It has to be. Um, here's what Jesus said. In John chapter eight, verse 31 to 32. You should be familiar with this a little bit because we've been talking about this this year. And Jesus said to the Jews who believed on him, if you continue in my word or if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth will make you what? It'll make you free. So there's a way to freedom. There's a path to, the living, to living the way that God intended. And really, it's what our theme is about this year. Abide or continue in him. Abide in him. Abide in his word. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Your willpower is not going to set you free. Your mind's, you know, in its own strength can't set you free. But the truth will set you free. I know people use that a lot right now because of all the truth people out there and and this and that, and they say, well, the truth will set you free. But really, the truth that will set you free is this truth. This is the optimum truth that will set you free. Jesus promised that if we would commit our minds and hearts to his word, the result would be a personal experience that sets us free. A personal experience with the word, with Jesus, that would set us free. Freedom is available to anyone who's experiencing either a bondage or battle in their life. But the battle for it is in your mind and in your thoughts. So the battle cannot be done by just using our willpower. It's not a battle of our will. It's a battle that needs to be fought in our minds. It's a, it's a, it's a has to, we have to change the way we think by the power of God's word. We need to use our will, but the battle cannot be won independently from our minds or override the powerful force of our thoughts. Will doesn't work without changing the way you think. You have to change the way you think. 
It all started back in the Garden of Eden, right? Like the devil came to Eve and he did to her what he tries to do to us today. He, instead of making a full on frontal assault on them, he kind of came around looking all nice, you know, like because it said that he was beautiful. It said that he was more cunning than any other creature, right? And he came to Adam and Eve and he came to Eve and he said, Eve, did God really say that? Like, are you sure? That's what God said. And then Eve said, yeah, like he said, but when she quoted it, she didn't quote it right. She said, if we, you know, if we eat the fruit of the tree or even look at it, it's a problem. Well, that's not what God said. If you eat the fruit is what he said. But then the devil said, like, this is what he said, and I'm just going to paraphrase it after I read it, right? He said, uh, and the serpent said to the woman, um, you will not surely die, for God knows the day you eat it, then your eyes will be open, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. He's like, God's trying to hold a little bit back from me here. He's a good guy. He's a nice guy. He's done good things. But like, honestly, if you just will take this fruit, you'll be like him. And he doesn't really want you to be like him because he doesn't think you can handle it. And that's probably true, right? <laughs> but anyway, he, he, he deceived her. He tricked her. He, he made her think. Isn't it funny, like, how the devil does that? I know I said this a couple weeks ago, but I want to remind you. Like, the devil will tempt you to do something, right? So, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, he'll tempt you right when you're when you're having an argument with someone you know well that person always talks to you that way it's time for you to stand up for yourself it's probably going to be good for you to stand up for yourself like your life matters you say something open your mouth say something and and like you're like well they're my friend and they probably didn't mean it and i don't want to hurt them and, and the devil's like yeah yeah but he, they're gonna walk all over you if you keep that up like you know what it's not right what they did to you, do you think that's right? No, no, I don't think it's right. So then you give it to them, you blast them, right? And next thing you know, the devil's standing there going, look, look at you, you hurt their feelings. You're an awful person. How can you even call yourself a Christian when you act that way? Have you ever noticed that about the devil? Like he always rides both sides of the door. He, he walks you through the door like a nice guy and then he gets you on the other side and he treats you like you're the biggest lowlife scumbag in the whole world. That's, that's his game. That's what he does. But he comes to you to tempt you and to try to get you to do things that you shouldn't do. We must understand this, that the battlefield for our freedom is in our minds. And the battle isn't between us and the devil. The battle is between God's word and the devil. We can't fight him by ourselves. Without God's word, we're really powerless against the devil. Like I know a lot of people are like really yappy about, you know, all oh, we have authority, we, and we do. And we have this, and we do. But the truth is, without the word of God, we don't have authority. We're just shooting off our mouth. But with God's word, we can fight the devil. Ephesians 6 tells us that the word of God is the sword of the spirit in our fight against the devil. Like if, when, you, when you read Ephesians 6, it tells you about the full armor of God. And, and the, the offensive weapon that we have for fighting is the word of God. Because the word of God is the truth, and the truth will set you free. Like the fight is for your freedom. I'm telling you this, like we have all kinds of battles. We have all kinds of things going on in our life, but the real battle we have is for our freedom. I want to be free. And like I think about heaven a lot. I think about what it's going to be like when I stand before Jesus. And the biggest thing I always think about is freedom. Like no more, right? Like does your head ever just go in circles about like, I wonder what that person did that for or, I wonder why they're pushing me to do this, or I'm, I wonder why, I wonder why, I wonder why. And, and like, so that's going to be gone, but it can be gone today too, because we can have freedom here. But ultimately, when we get to heaven, we're going to have total and complete freedom. It's going to be awesome. But 
We must understand we're helpless against Satan without God's word, right? And if we, we go into a fight with the devil without God's word, we're doomed to lose. We're doomed to lose. It's like taking a pencil sharpener to a gunfight. You know, it's like it doesn't work. And I, I did that on purpose. It wasn't a knife to a gunfight, but it's even worse than that. We, we have no offensive weapon without the word of God. We must understand that, that God has provided everything we need. When Jesus went to the wilderness after he's baptized, he went there to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he was at his weakest spot, the devil came to him. And the devil, um, the Bible, what is, if you look at your Bible, the heading is the temptation of Christ, right? So the devil came there in his weakest moment and tried to take Jesus off of his mission, off of his assignment. He tried to, he tried to trick the Son of God. Now, if you read the Bible, he did it once with Adam. Adam was the Son of God. He was pure without sin. He was living everything. Like the Bible calls him the first Adam. It calls Jesus the second Adam. And the devil had won that battle before. But every argument the devil came, he said, like, you know what, you're the Son of God. Why don't you just throw yourself off the top of this temple? God God will God will says his angels will catch you and you'll be okay. And Jesus said what? He said, It is written. You should not tempt the Lord your God. He said, like, turn this bread into stone. You're hungry. Why don't you turn the bread into stone? You can do that. Right? And then Jesus said, well, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every, every argument the devil came to him with, what did he return it with? It is written. And these are important words for us. Jesus not only defeated the devil that day, but he taught us how to defeat the devil in our own life. He taught us how to be free. And we need to understand that whenever we're coming against the enemy, we have to come with the word of God. He always responded with, it is written. And the awesome power of God's word defeated every attack of the enemy. Here's what Paul said in, first, in 2 Corinthians 10. He said, I beg you, he's talking to the church here, I beg you not to force me to be harsh with you when I come. For I am sure I can deal harshly with those who say that we act from worldly motives. It's true that we live in the world, but we do not um, fight from worldly motives. We live in this world, but we do not fight for morally, worldly motives. So when we're fighting with someone, it's not to protect our reputation. It's not to, like, you know, like so many times we live so carnally so we think about this world and the things of this world so much and we get tied up in all kinds of fights and arguments and stuff because of the things of this world but god really has something higher for us right he says this the weapons we use in the fight are not the world's weapons but godly powerful weapons which we use to destroy strongholds we destroy false arguments we pull down every proud obstacle that is raised against the knowledge of god we take every thought captive and we make it obedient we make it obey Christ. And after you have proved your complete loyalty, we will be ready to punish any act of disloyalty. This verse, these verses actually describe the reality of the battleground in our mind and the way to win the war for our freedom. Even though all that he writes here is true, the hardest part for us is that the weapons and the war that Paul describes are not visible and they are and must be entered into by faith. Like, so I live on this planet just like you, right? And so we believe a God that we cannot see, right? We're asked to pray to a God that we do not see. So many times we pray for things and it, it takes a while before sometimes we see things happen. And, and, and that's, Paul was saying like, this is not a physical flesh and blood battle. This is a spiritual battle. But you have to know it's a real battle. If you don't believe it's real, if you don't believe it's worth it, you're not going to fight the battle. If you don't believe that God's word is true and that God's word will set you free, you're never going to really take it seriously and use it. So Paul's saying, like, the weapons that we use are not physical weapons, right? And the war that we're fighting is not a physical war. 
It's difficult to fight an enemy that we can't see. But that's what we must do. We are going to live in the freedom that's planned for us if we, if we will fight in this fight. I think about the battle on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. And I've watched like, you know, shows like what, Saving Private Ryan and they're running up the beach and there's more of them dying that are getting in, out of the water, right? They're just, they're fighting. And they're like young guys. Some of them would lie to get in the army. They're like 17, 18 year old kids running up onto that beach. And why did they do that? Because they believed it was a real battle. They believed it was a real enemy that was going to take apart the world as they knew it. And our battle really is just as real as that battle. It's even more real and more important than that battle because we're fighting not for like a country. We're fighting for the freedom of mankind. We're fighting for people's salvation. We're fighting for them to know God. Paul tells us that our weapons are mighty for pulling down strongholds and everything the devil brings into our life to keep us in bondage. But the weapons will only work in an atmosphere of faith in which we're willing and obedient to engage the battle in our minds. We must bring every thought captive. So like when, when thoughts come to you, right? So I was, I was, you know, thinking about stuff the other day. But okay, so let's just go back a month, right? And and the government's like put down these rules that if you get out of your house, go get a coffee, police are going to pull you over, ask you where you're going. Right? And I'm like, a, I'm a bit of a fighter. So I'm like kind of ticked off, right? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. And my mind's starting to go. And Christine's like, Ralph, settle down. She could see it coming a mile away, right? And I just have to tell myself, no, 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 no. God told me that he would, that if I kept my mind set on him, he would keep me in perfect peace. So I just set my mind on you, Lord. I set my heart on you today. I set, I set my thoughts on you because I don't need to go down this path. It's not going to help. It's not going to help. It's going to be a mess. And so you do that. So for people that are struggling with pornography and you're, you're married or you're, you know, you have a, somebody in your life that's important to you and, and, and whatever, God's important to you and you, you start, you start going toward, you know, go and have a look. You know, and, and this is what this is what I keep this verse in my heart all the time. It was it was Job that said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon a maiden with lust. And I make that covenant, Lord. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna look at this because this is bad for me. This is gonna hurt my relationship with you, this is gonna hurt my relationship with my wife. This is this is not a good thing. And we take the word of God and we grab that thought that comes to us and we hold it, we take it captive. So when you're struggling with insecurity and you're wondering, like, I can never do what I think I'm supposed to do because this or this or this or this. And you say, the Bible says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you just take hold of that thought that says you can't. And you say, no, that thought does not agree with God's word. I'm going to throw it out. It's, it's hard, but it's free. You'll be free. We must bring every thought into captivity. This verse says, the verse says, this means we make them submit to the authority of Jesus, who is the word. Here's the truth you need to know. We do not live in a neutral place. I need to go back. There was something here I wanted to tell you. Okay, so here's the thing. We're in a battle, and the Bible says take every thought captive, and we're not living in a neutral place. We're living in a place that's going one way or another. Like you're either following the wrong thoughts or you're following God's thoughts, right? And the Bible says take every thought captive. And here's the problem. Because we're not neutral, if you don't take the thought captive, that thought will take you captive. Have you experienced that? So like, if you don't take a thought captive, that thought will take you captive and you will start to think and be captive to that thought. It will take you captive 
by building a stronghold in your mind. Like the thing is, you know what? Like every little thing starts out. Like I really worry. I shouldn't worry, but I'm concerned for the kids in our generation right now, the ones who have lived through all this mess. That they've they've watched adults with face masks on. And they're not allowed to hug their grandparents or their uncles or their aunts. And they're they're scared. And they're taught to be scared. And and this is a stronghold that develops in their mind. I can't trust adults. I can't let people touch me. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And that stronghold builds and it builds. And then something bad happens to them a little later and it, and it builds even more. And these things just start off as something little. Oh yeah, well, we're just protecting the kids. We're just protecting the grandparents from the kids. We're just doing this, we're doing that, but we're building a little stronghold that's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And we have to, if you're Christian parents today, I'm telling you, you got to talk to your kids about this. You got to let your kids know they can't be afraid of, of people. They can't be afraid of like physical touch and a hug. They can't be afraid to hug their grandparents.